Hey everyone, welcome to the video for section 9.1. So this will be a short section, it's only got one video attached to it. But the idea is that this section sort of brings all the stuff together we've talked about so far for chapter 7, about all the different types of pictures we've been drawing for these face portraits, it kind of brings all of it together into a nice little summary, collecting all of it into a bundle of bundle of information. Um, so that's kind of what this section does. It has a bunch of pictures in there, and we're going to go through them and sort of talk about all of them real quick here. So let's go ahead and get on into um, what we're doing for this section. So like I said, the idea of this section is to bring everything together and put it all in the appropriate context. So the context is we're solving ODEs of the following form, x prime equals a times x, where a is a constant matrix. And what we assume in general, um, and it happens almost all the time, is that we'll assume that the determinant of a itself is non-zero, which, by stuff we talked about before, the only solution to ax equals zero is x equals zero, which is sort of what I want to get out of that. So we want to combine that fact with the idea of autonomous systems back from chapter two and the stuff we're doing in chapter seven to sort of piece all this together. So for autonomous systems, we analyzed equilibrium solutions or critical points to sort of see what was going on around them. And how do we do that? Well, we set x prime to be zero and saw what happened. So these, in this case, x prime equals zero just means that ax equals zero, but we said above, this means that x equals zero. So you only have one critical point and it's at the origin. So we want to see what happens for curves that are near zero, but not at zero. Because if they're at zero, we're just there forever and that's all that happens. We want to see if we're nearby, what happens? And the way we analyze this is through the eigenvector eigenvalue approach that we did in all of chapter seven. And I want to sort of put all that together. So the behavior around zero, around x equals zero, depends on the matrix A. Right, so for our autonomous case, we had y prime equals f of y. And then depending on whether f of y was increasing, decreasing, positive, negative, we can determine what happened to solutions that were near any of your critical points. Here, we just have x prime equals a matrix A times x. So properties of this matrix, as opposed to being the function from before, the properties of the matrix determine what's happening to solutions nearby. And that's how we get our set of face ports that we've been using all of chapter seven throughout this entire past week. So in particular, this depends on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. So now we're gonna go through and look at all the different cases for what can happen to all these different types of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and pull these pictures and talk about them all up here. So the first case that we talked about were real and distinct eigenvalues. And then in this case, we have our general solution, x of t is going to be c1, c1, e to the r1t, plus c2, c2, e to the r2t. And then we had different cases based on the signs of R1 and R2. So for these, we're all going to assume that R1 is bigger than R2, and then specify other cases. So case one is if R1 is bigger than R2 is bigger than zero. This gives us our nodal source, because both eigenvalues are positive. So what does this look like? Well, if I have this, if I have C1 going this way, C2 going this way, then everything is flowing away. I know that I come into the origin tangent to the R2 line as t goes to minus infinity, and then I go parallel to the R1 line as t goes to plus infinity. So I get something that looks like this. That's the kind of picture you get for that kind of case. You can see all these pictures in the book too. But basically, you know you're coming into zero tangent to the um, C2 line and you go to infinity parallel to C1. And then there's the opposite case where R1 and R2 are both less than zero, in which case you get a nodal source. So C1 up here, C2 down here, everything's going in. And since R2 is vanishing first, because R2 is more negative, I know I come into zero tangent to C1, and I go to infinity parallel to C2. So that gives me curves that look like this. And 
everything is going in towards the center. So that's your picture there. Also, to point out, this guy is sta asymptotically stable because things are flowing into zero, so zero is asymptotically stable. And our first guy here is unstable because curves nearby are running away. Now, case three is our saddle point. This is if R2 is less than zero is less than R1. So we get something like this. C1 up here, C2 down here. And now since R1 is positive and R2 is negative, I know I approach the C1 line as T goes to infinity and I approach the C2 line as T goes to minus infinity. So my curves are something like, well, I know C1 is going away, C2 is coming in, and my curves look like they're all along this line, they come across, and they go up along this line. There's your sort of picture there. You can draw more lines too if you want. In this case, we also see that zero is unstable because if any point anywhere nearby is going to take off as t goes to infinity. Because if t goes to infinity, it's going to follow the c1 line further and further away. So zero is unstable here as well. The next thing we dealt with in terms of eigenvalues was complex eigenvalues. And the general solution there is a little harder to sort of write out, but you end up with something that looks of the form uh, c1 e to the lambda t times some sines or cosines plus c2 e to the lambda t times more sines and cosines. I'm writing it this way because while there is a general way to write it, it looks kind of weird. It's easier to think of it this way, that you just get sines and cosines times some exponential terms. Now, there are different cases based on what lambda is and sort of which way it rotates. Now, rotation, I'm not going to distinguish between here because you just do that from the individual problem. But your three cases here are case one, if lambda is positive, then I get a spiral source because everything's going to fall away from the center. So I get something that if I have this, I get things that are spiraling out of the center, spiraling out of the center, spiraling out of the center, things like that. And that's just your general picture. To get more something specific, you have to have a specific solution you want to start plugging in. Case two is lambda negative, and that gives me my spiral sink. And this looks similar to the opposite. Now everything is sort of spiraling into the center. Things like that. Now, if you analyze this, you'll see that this one here, zero is asymptotically stable because everything flows in towards zero as time goes on. If I go back up to my source, this guy, zero is unstable. Same so as before, if I'm nearby but I'm not at zero, I eventually spiral my way away from zero, so it's unstable. And the third case, this is lambda equals zero, this is our center. And this is a strange one where solutions don't really move at all, and I get ellipses. They could be slanted, they could be centered. They're going to be centered, but they could be slanted or normal, and you get ellipses. And here, zero is stable. And here I mean stable and not asymptotically stable because things aren't going in towards zero. Things that are near zero just stay nearby. They don't run away, but they also don't get closer. So this is a stable equilibrium point, not an asymptotically stable one. There's the reason why I've been emphasizing asymptotically stable so much is for this reason here. And the final case we dealt with was our repeated roots. So case one here was two different eigenve eigenvectors. And this gave me my proper node. So this looks something like every solution was a line through the origin. And these are either going all in or all out based on the sign of my eigenvalue. So r bigger than zero means zero is unstable. And r less than zero means zero is asymptotically stable because the subfunctions flow either in or away, into zero or away from zero, depending on the sign of R. And then our case two was if we needed to use a generalized eigenvector. And this gave us our improper nodes. And those looked something like, you've got your C, your eigenvector here, and then your curves sort of look something like this, 
depending on the actual sign and specific problem, you'll either get this curve or the other one. Something like that as the sort of picture you're going to get there. And we have 0 is unstable if R is positive, and 0 is asymptotically stable if R is negative, just as before. All right, so there's all the stuff we've seen so far. That is all the phase portraits we've done so far in this class. It's a lot, I know, but they all sort of fit in nice little categories. Um, so this chapter sort of puts it all together in a nice little package, so it's a good place to go back to to look at to review this stuff. Um, and that's what we've got here. Now this will be important for stuff going forward when we start looking at nonlinear systems, which is the rest of chapter 9, which is why they put this here, to get you thinking about this again before they start doing more fancy things with it in the next couple sections. So we'll need to come back to all this stuff when we get to stuff in chapter 9, but for now this serves as a nice sort of summary point for the end of chapter 7, end of this all different eigenvalues, different sort of eigenvectors, setups that we can have. Wrap it all up, put it nicely together, and here is the final sort of result for everything we've done so far in this chapter. All right, that's it for this video in this section. Uh, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.